Good evening and welcome to uh, our fall season of Basic Science Lights the Way. This series, series, as you may know, has been running for seven seasons now, and we are grateful that you continue to tune in as we share the latest groundbreaking science at UC Berkeley. Tonight's topic is particularly fascinating to me. Astrophysicists like myself are now beginning to study the atmospheres of extrasolar planets to see if they can find evidence for life. However, there are still very important and interesting things to learn about our own planet Earth and the complex interactions that occur between the biosphere, the oceans, the land masses, and the atmosphere. And of course, of particular concern now is the effect that we humans are having on the planet. Climate change is one of the defining struggles of our time. Last month was the hottest September on record by a large margin. Millions of people from around the globe have mobilized to research and advance policies to stave off disaster. And UC Berkeley plays a huge role in this debate. Tonight, you're going to hear from our moderator and three speakers about the work they do to better, under, better understand the triggers and impacts of climate change and how that affects us all. Our, our speakers will break down this broad topic and enlighten us about the science behind rainfall, air pollution, atmospheric chemistry, extreme weather events, and community impacts. Once we're underway, I hope you will post your questions for any of our, our speakers in the chat box, and we will uh, answer as many of them as we can in the time allotted. Uh, so let me introduce our moderator uh, this evening. Uh, she is Sunny Ivey, uh, Assistant Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Berkeley and the Principal Investigator of the Air Quality Modeling and Exposure Lab. Uh, Sunny's research focuses on the nexus of air pollution science and engineering and environmental justice. She is an emerging leader in the areas of regional air quality modeling and its applications and community scale air pollution exposure assessment. Sunny works in partnership with community organizations across California to prevent the over-industrialization of already overburdened neighborhoods. In recognition of her advocacy for frontline communities, of the e-commerce supply chain expansion in inland Southern California. She was selected as a member of the American Chemical Society's Chemical and Engineering News Talented 12-2021 class and a 2022 Woman in Science Incentive Prize winner by the Story Exchange. We're delighted to have you here this evening as our moderator, Sunny. So let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Steve. It's great to be here. I'm very excited to be the host of the first Basic Science Lights the Way event of the semester. As mentioned, tonight we will hear from some of my distinguished colleagues about the ways in which climate change affects you. My research encompasses environmental justice, which is a movement to protect vulnerable communities from being inundated with environmental hazards, such as Superfund sites, landfills, and various industrial facilities that emit toxic pollutants. There have been numerous research studies, as well as anecdotal evidence, showing that pollution exposure is linked to an increased risk of acquiring disease, which inherently creates a disproportionate health burden on these vulnerable populations. This can lead to disproportionate quality of education, as children living in these areas report increased school absences, environmental justice impacts are multidimensional, and they have long-term health and socioeconomic consequences. At the end of each talk, we will try to address all of the questions from the audience, so please add your questions to the chat. We will now proceed to hear from our first speaker, Professor John Chang. John Chang is a professor in the Department of Geography at the University of California, Berkeley. His research focus is on climate dynamics, working on both contemporary and paleoclimate research questions. 
and with a focus on understanding how global and regional rainfall changes in response to climate variations and forcings. He obtained his BSc in Physics and Mathematics at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, an MS in Physics in, at Cornell University, and a PhD in Earth and Environmental Sciences at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University. John, thank you for joining us this evening. Will you please share your slides? Good evening, everyone. Uh, what you have in front of you is a map of uh, rainfall on Earth, highlighting in particular uh, a band of rainfall across the tropics or the tropical rain band. Now, how tropical rain bands respond to climate change has been a long-standing interest of mine. <clears throat> and I'd like to tell you a story about how uh, studying uh, changes to an ocean circulation and its impact on tropical rain bands taught me about how the rain band changes. Now, this ocean circulation has been in the news recently. These are some headlines over the past summer. Uh, is a mega ocean current about to shut down? Now, this mega ocean current is the Atlantic Thermohaline circulation, uh, which is a current taking warm tropical waters from the tropical Atlantic up through the Gulf Stream uh, to the North Atlantic, where it cools and sinks. So it releases its heat to the atmosphere and keeps the weather and climate warm in the North Atlantic region. <clears throat> So you shut down the circulation, you would cool this region quite dramatically. So why do we even think that this circulation was shut down in the first place? Uh, for one, we know that this has happened in the distant past, uh, specifically during the last ice age, uh, about 80,000 to 20,000 years ago. And we know this because of proxy records of climate from things like ocean sediment records, and especially ice core records from Greenland. Uh, so what the Iceland, uh, Green, uh, Greenland ice core records show us is that uh, Greenland actually underwent through periods of cold and then jump into warm and then cold again. So it'll be warm for a warm for hundred years and then switch to cold for a couple hundred years and switch back to warm. Uh, and then we think that these changes are caused by on and off switches of the Atlantic thermal haline circulation. Uh, so if these, uh, these temperature changes are actually quite large, uh, so the, between cold and warm would be about 10 degrees Celsius, this is kind of like going from the climate of Miami to the climate of Minnesota. So if the temperature changes were local, just locally in the North Atlantic, we might not care about it as much. Uh, but we also know that from other paleoclimate records that uh, when Greenland becomes cold or warm, climates of other regions of the globe uh, changes as well. Uh, one such region is the tropical Atlantic. And this region is characterized by a rain band stretching across from South America to the west, uh, to West Africa in the east. And whenever Greenland was cold in this past climate, uh, what paleoclimatologists found is that the rain band shifts southwards. And then when it became warm, the Greenland, uh, then the rain band shifts northwards. Uh, so early on in my career, I was a student of the climate of this region. And I was fascinated by this paleoclimate result for two reasons. One is that if these rain band shifts were to occur uh, in present day climate, it will cause major climate disruption. Uh, if the rain band were to shift north, then Northeast Brazil would be under perpetual drought. Uh, if the rain band were to shift south, then West Africa would also be in perpetual drought. Um, so the other reason was that uh, given our understanding of the dynamics of this region at the time, we actually didn't understand why uh, an influence as far away as Greenland would affect the tropical rain band uh, thousands of miles away. Uh, so my group and I spent several years trying to look at this problem to try and figure out what was going on uh, using the tools of modern climate dynamics, including climate models. Uh, so this is what we found. Uh, if you shut down the thermal haline circulation, you not only cool the North Atlantic region, you actually cool the entire Northern hemisphere. Uh, and this is uh, communicated through by the atmosphere, and it's aided by several positive feedbacks uh, that amplify the response, including cloud feedbacks, sea ice, and water vapor feedbacks. Now, this cooling also permeates into the tropics, with acts to shift the uh, uh, rain band southwards. Uh, so you can simply think of this as the rain band likes the warmer hemisphere. So in this case, uh, it will shift southwards. Uh, the monsoon regions over Africa and North uh, and Asia would also be weakened as a result. 
Um, if you zoom out and see the pattern, you, you see a characteristic pattern, which I call the inner hemispheric pattern, uh, where the temperature changes cools in one hemisphere and warms in the other hemisphere. And this differential response uh, between the different hemispheres is what shifts the rain band, in this case, southwards. What we also learned was that uh, it's not just ocean circulation that can do this. So for example, uh, our industries are concentrated mainly in the north and they uh, skew pollution in the form of sulfate particles. So these sulfate particles are bright, uh, so they reflect sunlight. And as a result, the northern hemisphere cools as a result. And what we found in this study is that the tropical Atlantic uh, rain band actually shifted southward over the course of the 20th century because of the sulfate aerosol pollution. Uh, another example was is with uh, mid-latitude afforestation. Uh, afforestation is planting trees where there were no trees before, and you might do something like this because of, for, ex for example, uh, you want to sequester carbon. Now, if you uh, afforest uh, enough, large enough regions, what we find is that the tropical rain bands might actually shift northwards. And this is because the trees that replace the grassland is actually darker, uh, so it absorbs more sunlight and makes the northern hemisphere warmer. Um, so let me get back to the question of what happens to the thermal haline circulation in the future. Um, unlike those uh, newspaper uh, high headlines, the prevailing understanding uh, is that thermal haline circulation will not abruptly shut down, at least it's not, and very unlikely to do so, but rather it will weaken over the course of the 21st century. Uh, but the weakening is actually quite large. Uh, a most recent model estimate uh, would be about 34 to 45% decrease by the year 2100. Uh, so, but regardless, whether or not the thermal haline sh shuts down or weakens, either would have an uh, impact on the tropical rain bands in the, the sense that I described. Um, so I'd like to highlight a, a recent uh, study by my group. This is by Paul Nicknish. And what Paul found was that uh, tropical rain band shifts in the future are caused by two main causes. Uh, one is the weakening of the thermal haline circulation, which shifts the tropical rain band southwards in the greater tropical Atlantic sector. Uh, the other, interestingly, it turns out to be changes from the tropical Pacific that shifts the rain band in the east-west direction, which is interesting in itself, but a different story. Um, I, I met, also mentioned that Paul Nicknish was actually a sophomore when he started his work with me. And uh, this, his work recently got published in a major, uh, major climate science journal this year, which is a major accomplishment for an undergrad. Uh, Paul is now a second year uh, PhD student at MIT working on climate science. Um, I'd like to end up with some lessons I learned from this research. Uh, first thing I learned is the susceptibility of tropical rain bands to change. And, and this matters for us because the geography of population is closely tied to the geography of rainfall. Uh, we live where we have access to water. Uh, the second thing I learned is the interconnectivity of climate, uh, especially between the polar and the tropical regions, and that changes in the tropical uh, polar regions uh, can uh, affect the climate of the tropics uh, thousands of miles away. Uh, the third one is the importance of curiosity-driven driven research. Uh, when I started off this research, I wasn't trying to uh, ask the question, how do tropical rainfall change and how it affects humans? Uh, rather, I was actually interested in the paleo climate problem of why the tropical Atlantic rain band was so sensitive to changes over Greenland. And when I researched this, this, this was what I learned of, of the tropical rain band. So um, basic, uh, basic science did indeed light the way for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was quite illuminating. It looks like we have a few questions queued up for you in response to your presentation. Uh, the first question, what is your top recommendation for anthropogenic mitigation of the disruptive global changes in precipitation that we see in your, in your work? Um. Really, the only way to mitigate this is to reduce and eventually eliminate our carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, so the root cause of all these changes uh, to thermal haline shutdown, for example, uh, is the warming earth and the greenhouse gases that we put in. So the only, really the only way to do this is to uh, eventually eliminate this. 
And what I'd like to also highlight is that if you slow down the thermal headline circulation, it, it takes a, a long time to spin it back up again. So even if we quit to shut it down now, it will take time for the thermal headline circulation to respond and then get back to its normal state. What's the time scale of that natural movement oh, back to its natural state? I mean, so it depends on how, how, how much we shut down. It could be from uh, so tens to hundreds, uh, even thousands of years. Yeah. So okay, it thank you. a long time. Well, we have a second question for you. What do you conclude that there will not be an abrupt, or excuse me, why do you conclude that there will not be an abrupt or drastic decline in the Atlantic thermal haline circulation pattern? And part two of this question is, how might its weakening in the future alter global climate? Oh, yeah. So that's the first part is a very interesting question. Uh, so um, this is science at the cutting edge. Uh, so what the newspaper report reported was uh, one study that tried to argue uh, based on so like looking at the trajectory of the today's thermohaline circulation uh, that it could shut down by about mid-century. Uh, however, uh, most of us, uh, uh, so like the large majority of studies, which look at from the case of uh, using climate models to simulate art in the future, uh, do not really see this abrupt shift. Um, so the way when you think, when, you, when I say climate models, think of climate models as uh, the encapsulation of the best of our knowledge. Uh, so, but you know, on the other hand, there are people that think that, hey, maybe uh, climate models are not getting it right. And that maybe we should say, so there's those people that say that the thermal heat circulation might abruptly change in the future would appeal to things like uh, what happened in the distant past where it did do so. Um, so, uh, so in a nutshell, um, this is now a, a topic of debate within the community. Uh, this is a normal part of science. Uh, and in fact, it's necessary for the science to advance it, and it takes time for the science to settle. So, so yeah. Um, and in terms of uh, shutdown of thermal halo circulation, so tropical rain band shifts are, are definitely one such. Uh, you'll see cooling uh, over Europe. Uh, where we are in California, uh, this is not based on paleo proxy records. Uh, we should expect uh, the climate to be rainier. Yeah, so there are global impacts all around the world from thermal halo shutdown. Uh, I'd like to make an analogy. Uh, so, uh, up, uh, <clears throat> We are expecting El Nino to, to occur this year. And El Nino is another type of climate change which affects climate all around the world. And then this, this cause is caused because of, uh, so like this, uh, these changes are caused by atmospheric waves that are so like communicated both north and south from the tropical Pacific region. So it's kind of like this. Uh, it, so this is kind of like a, a loose analogy to what would happen under thermal headline ch circulation changes. Wonderful, thank you. And one last question. Why does Greenland have a large, disproportionately large effect on ocean circulation? Um, so it's not Greenland per se. Uh, so I mentioned Greenland because that's the, the closest location to the epicenter of the thermal haline circulation. So if the thermal haline circulation weakens, then the, the temperature cools most notably in the Greenland region. And that was, is also where we have our paleo proxy records. Um, but that being said, it's a good question because, um, so the question is, why would the North Atlantic have such a disproportionately large influence? And that's actually is a very interesting question because um, the high latitude North Atlantic, if you look at on the map, uh, it's actually relatively small uh, compared to say the tropics, which is you know, tropical Atlantic and tropical Pacific, which is quite large. So it's almost like the, the tail wagging the dog in a sense. Um, so uh, I don't understand this fully, but part of it is that the, the cooling of the North Atlantic is amplified uh, by things like uh, cloud feedbacks and sea ice feedbacks. So both of those would actually amplify the initial cooling from the uh, shutdown of the thermal haline circulation. Well, thank you very much for 
those wonderful answers and we will move on to our next speaker, Professor Bill Boots. Bill Boos is an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science, and he leads a research group in climate dynamics. Bill works to improve understanding of the mechanisms controlling tropical climate with a particular focus on monsoons, tropical cyclones, and the extreme weather events that affect billions of people living in vulnerable socioeconomic conditions. He received his PhD from MIT and his bachelor's degree from the State University of New York at Binghamton. Bill, we welcome you to share your research with us. Great, thank you, Sunny. Uh, everyone, it's great to be here with, with you all. It's such a big group. And I'm going to talk to you today about extreme rainfall in monsoons, uh, specifically, the dynamics and the trends, uh, climate change trends of extreme monsoon rainfall. I'm specifically going to talk about how one of the dominant or the dominant type of catastrophic storm uh, is changing in Earth's most densely populated region. And just to remove all, all mystery, the, the, uh, the region I'm talking about is South Asia, the very well-known South Asian monsoon, where the population densities are, are just unlike anything we have as a point of reference here in North America. Uh, this is the densely populated Indo-Gangetic Plain up here. Uh, and furthermore, over these countries of India, Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, even Pakistan, the population growth rates over the past 20 years have been very large, uh, exceeding 10% uh, over nearly all of this uh, south part of Asia. Uh, in many regions uh, being in the 20 to 40% range. Now, I'm talking about monsoons. Uh, what is a monsoon? So a monsoon is not an uh, uh, intense thunderstorm that happens on one particular day. It is actually a pattern of wind and rainfall, but foremost we think of it as a pattern of wind that spans an entire continent. And so what you're looking at here on this animation are winds about one and a half kilometers above Earth's surface. And you see this very large region here that spans almost all of South Asia, where the wind speeds are quite fast. They're uh, in excess of 40 miles per hour here in these, these green areas, uh, eastward, uh, sweeping across continental India. And I wanna draw your attention to this, this boxed region where the wind is starting to curl up a little bit into this somewhat circular pattern uh, that we call an atmospheric vortex. And this is the beginning of what we actually call a monsoon depression, which is that dominant type of storm that I'm talking about in, in this region. I'm zooming in now on that, that, what was that yellow box, and this is, uh, rainfall on the next day now, shown in colors, together with the wind at one and a half kilometers altitude, still still animated as these little white white particles. And what you see is that the the flow pattern, the atmospheric wind pattern, has really become very circular now. We, we've formed a vortex, and the rain rates are are strong. They're exceeding uh, thirty centimeters, or about a, a foot a, a day of rainfall. And the rainfall, the peak rainfall, is actually occurring not centered on the vortex, but sort of on the southwestern side of the vortex center. That is actually very typical of these sorts of storms. This is a classic monsoon depression forming just a, a couple months ago. Uh, and about 10 to 15 of these storms form each summer over this fairly small region. Of, of South Asia. They form over this very northern part of the Indian Ocean and then sort of propagate to the, to the west, northwest over this region, dumping rain as they go. And the rain that they dump is extreme. Uh, this is just one example of the effect of one monsoon depression. It's a flood that occurred in a northern part of India called Uttarakhand. Uh, this is about a decade ago. Uh, these particular floods killed uh, in excess of 6,000 people. 
Uh, and you will see many, many such events over, over the years. It is not unusual as you watch the monsoon uh, unfold over Asia to see uh, multiple events each year where, where hundreds to even thousands of people ha have died. And these events are, are frequent. I, I said that we get about 10 to 15 of these storms occurring each summer over that fairly small region. Uh, so I want to ask a question now that's uh, one thing that we have focused on a lot in my research, which is why do these storms form uh, so frequently over South Asia? And the answer has to do with something that we call hydrodynamic instability. It's hydrodynamic instability of the winds a couple kilometers above Earth's surface. And I want to illustrate to you now by means of a, a simulation of a very idealized distribution of wind, uh, what a hydrodynamic instability looks like. So I'm going to show you an animation where the flow is in one direction. Think of this as a map where we're looking down at the earth, uh, east is to the right and north is going up as in typical map view. And the winds are eastward here in this southern part of the domain. Think of that as that strong eastward monsoon flow that I showed you before, the wind spanning tens of thousands of kilometers across the South Asian continent. And then the wind reverses direction and becomes uh, weaker or even westward in this northern part of the domain. And I'm putting here a, a, a dye strip in the middle of the fluid so that you can see what happens to the fluid, to the air, as the simulation proceeds. You'll see it starts to undulate, and then it actually breaks down and forms individual vortices. The vortices merge together. And what we have here is a process of the fluid flow or the air flow breaking down from that, that uniform eastward monsoon wind pattern spanning the continent into individual vortices. And the connection to climate change here is that this is a, a snapshot of that animation that I showed you before of the strong eastward winds sweeping across India that we expect that those strong eastward winds are actually going to shift toward the north as the climate is warming. Uh, these are projections that are emerging from a, a lot of uh, climate models, as John said, that, that encapsulate our best understanding of the climate system and atmospheric dynamics. And so we expect as, that, as those strong eastward monsoon winds shift northward, a lot of work that my group has done over the past five years or so is that we expect the region of storm formation to move uh, northward, uh, northward or poleward. I've kind of combined those two wor words here. Uh, and I'm showing you here from one of our analyses from a paper that is actually right now uh, in press. Uh, so it'll be it'll appear in print and then in another month or two. I'm showing you here the projected change in the number of monsoon depressions forming in a particular region in, over South Asia. The orange is a decrease in the number of storms forming, and uh, the purple is an increase. So we see fewer storms forming in the southern part of the domain and more forming over land in the northern part of the domain, sort of the number of storms uh, overall shifting deeper into this densely populated continental region. Additionally, we also have work uh, that again is coming uh, out of my group, just hot off the presses, that shows that the air over South Asia has humidified more rapidly than anywhere else on earth. And that the rain rates in these monsoon depressions uh, have concurrently increased. And this is not something that we're projecting, but this is something that we've actually observed to have happened already over the last uh, few decades. So I'm showing you here first a composite or an average in a storm-centered coordinate system where this sort of zero, zero line, uh, this intersection is the center of the vortex. And we have here uh, sort of the wind sort of moving counterclockwise around the storm like I showed you before in the early animation in this talk. And the peak rainfall is occurring southwest of the center of the vortex. 
when we look at the trends in the rain rate that we have observed over the past 40 years, uh, green on this plot represents an area where the rain is increasing. And we see that the rain is increasing most southwest of the vortex center, which is where the peak rain is already occurring in these storms. So the rainy region is getting even rainier. This has implications for the number of extreme events occurring over South Asia. In particular, if we draw a box over central India and we count the number of extreme rain events that occur there every year, we can see that there's some variability year to year. There's one dot for the number of rain events occurring each year. But if we fit a trend line, we see that that trend line goes from a nominal amount of about 250 events per year back in the 1980s to almost 400 events per year in the current, current time period. So this is a huge increase in the number of extreme rain events that we think a large fraction of that is coming from these monsoon depressions getting even rainier as time goes on. So that's uh, my talk. A uh, quick summary to, to wrap up is that we have these, if, if nothing else, I want you to take away today that these atmospheric vortices called monsoon depressions, they produce intense rainfall over South Asia, subjecting more than a billion people to frequent catastrophic floods. And my group's work here at Berkeley has shown that these storms form frequently in this region because of a hydrodynamic instability of these continental scale eastward monsoon winds. And as far as climate change goes, uh, we have seen the rain rates of these monsoon depressions increase over the past 40 years, and we expect the region in which these storms are forming as they become rainier to shift northward in coming decades. If you want some more information on any of this, uh, you can find a number of papers on this topic in the publication section of my group's website. So I will leave it there. And if we have time, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That was very interesting. So we have a Thanks, few questions Sonny. for, yeah, we have a few questions for you. The first question is, is there a monsoon that affects us here in the U.S. or might in the future? Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, and and I fully realize that the, uh, you know, the, the title of this session was how climate change affects you. Um, you depends, well, where you are. And I'm sure that we have some members of our audience who have connections with South Asia or are from that region. Um, but we expect monsoons in all continents to change. And there is indeed a North American monsoon. Uh, some of the uh, thunderstorm weather that we get here in California uh, that causes wildfires because of the lightning, uh, that can be uh, because of the North American monsoon. So the North American monsoon is primarily a rainfall maximum over Mexico, but it also produces a lot of rain, sometimes catastrophic rain in uh, New Mexico, Arizona, even as far north as Colorado. And sometimes in the North American monsoon, thunderstorm activity drifts westward into California. Yeah, it's very interesting for us. Okay, and so the next question is, how are monsoon depressions different from hurricanes? Yes, uh, thank you for asking that. So monsoon depressions are a type of atmospheric vortex and hurricanes, as well as typhoons, uh, Typhoon is basically a hurricane that occurs in the Western Pacific Ocean. Uh, monsoon depressions are something that is much weaker in terms of the winds. Uh, but, you know, a hurricane, you can easily have uh, 100 mile per hour winds in a hurricane. A monsoon depression is, think of it as a very weak hurricane in terms of winds. The, the wind speeds will be maybe 20 miles an hour. But the way that they produce catastrophe is uh, really via their rainfall. Uh, monsoon depressions can actually intensify into a typhoon, 
hurricane intensity storm. Uh, but they don't typically do that during the peak monsoon season because the the winds in the monsoon actually keep them fairly weak. Uh, but in sort of if you get a monsoon depression forming very or very early in the monsoon season or very late, they can spin up into full blown typhoons. Yeah. Wow. And as a pivot for that, what causes those transitions to typhoons at the end of the season? So I think that uh, um, a lot of times the uh, the storms, if they don't have an environment that is preventing them from intensifying, uh, like an environment that has these strong changes in wind across different directions, uh, which we call wind shear, uh, then the storms will like to, they will sort of spontaneously intensify into typhoon strength. Um, so we often have a situation in the world where these vortices like monsoon depressions that are spinning up out of the monsoon state uh, will often intensify into hurricanes and typhoons given the chance. Uh, most, met many, many if not most of the hurricanes that we experience in the US actually spin up out of vortices that originate in the African monsoon. And so I could tell you, you know, instead of focusing on the Asian monsoon, we could focus on the African monsoon and how it's sending off these vortices that are not that intense over Africa, but they become hurricane strength over the Atlantic Ocean and then bring catastrophe to our shores here in the US. Yeah, absolutely. And one final question I'll ask is, how much of an increase in rainfall from monsoon depressions in South Asia might occur with climate change? So yes, great question. So I was telling you in my talk about the increase in rain rates that we've observed over the past 40 years. Um, we do expect that increase in rain rate to continue. We think that a large part of it is probably due mainly to the fact that as the climate warms, the amount of water vapor that can be present in the atmosphere increases by about 7% for each one degree Celsius of warming. So you can imagine that if we have a warming of about you know, four degrees Celsius, that you might get four times four degrees times 7% per degree, you might get 28, 30% increase in water content and in, in rainfall. So we, we expect these increases in, in rain rates to not be small, you know, think 30, 40% increase in, in rainfall in, in throughput of water through your urban sewage system, et cetera. So these are, these are large changes in water. Well, thank you so much for those answers and for the work that you do. Thank We're you. Gonna move on. Yeah. And thank you all for being here. We will now move on to our final speaker for this evening, Professor Ron Cohen. Ron Cohen is a professor of chemistry and earth and planetary sciences. His research focuses on observing and understanding the chemicals in the earth's atmosphere, especially connections between poor air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, and urban living. Ron received his PhD at UC Berkeley. After completing postdoctoral research at Harvard University, where he studied the ozone hole, he joined the faculty at Berkeley. Cohen is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the American Association of the Advancement of Science. His favorite thing about Berkeley is the opportunity he has to mentor students who are new to the practice of science. With that, I'll turn it over to Ron. Thank you so much, Sonny. Uh, so I appreciate a chance to uh, talk to you today about our research. Um, you heard from John about climate change on global scales and Bill about continental scales. And I wanna bring, bring you back to uh, urban scales at the end, sort of narrowing us our focus as we've gone through the day here. 
Uh, and I, I want you to think about cities and uh, air pollution in cities. You're looking at an example of smog here where you can see the haze uh, obstructing your view a little bit. And then the advent of the electric car and how that's going to play out and change uh, our experience of air pollution in cities. Um, so as, as Sunny told you, my research is motivated to about the understanding the chemicals in our atmosphere and uh, the connection with climate. And it's also motivated by the connection between what we breathe and our health. Uh, we do this in a few different ways. One is we make maps of the air in cities. Uh, here's an example in the San Francisco Bay Area where every green dot you see there is a place where we're making observations of the air. And when we assemble those observations, we have a map of CO2, a greenhouse gas, some air pollution gases, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, ozone, and, uh, and aerosol particles, PM 2.5. Um, and uh, the history of air pollution research ha has a number of important aspects to it. But one uh, important aspect is that is the car. The, the car has been the key source of air pollution in many in most cities for decades now. And we've been attempting to clean up the car and reduce its emissions uh, for most of the, the lifetimes of everyone in the audience here. So uh, you could think of this graph I'm showing you where the concentrations of important pollutants in the atmosphere have been coming down. They've been coming down since about 1960 at, at about 7% per year consistently over time. It's an amazing consistent story of progress in cleaning cars. Uh, and you see that in observations. Here's an example of observations of the chemical nitrogen oxides. Uh, again, about 7% per year. And you see in the green that weekends are about half the amount on weekdays. And that's because cars end up emitting a different amount of nitrogen oxides per uh, the amount of cars on the road than trucks. Trucks, heavy duty trucks, uh, uh, run hotter and they put out more nitrogen oxides and about half the nitrogen oxides in, in any cities in the US's atmosphere come from the heavy duty trucking. The, uh, the other thing that, that um, you see in air pollution is uh, that the, I'm sorry, is that the, there's a decrease in the organic chemicals that come uh, from vehicles. And that, that decrease is not as simple and linear as the decrease in the nitrogen oxides. And that's because, um, let's see. That's because there are other emissions that aren't from cars that are important. And that those emissions aren't being regulated. And for example, uh, they, they might come from trees. So, the way I want you to think about the current study of air pollution is that we have 50 or 60 years of incredible controls on vehicles, and we've reached the point where vehicles are now so clean that emissions from other things that humans do are becoming important. And that's from cooking or trees we plant or solvents we use for cleaning, painting, deodorant, all kinds of other things. Um, and you know, until very recently, none of those were important to our thinking about air pollution. Um, the other thing I want you to think about is that on a hot day, the emissions from all those other sources and especially from trees are higher so that vehicles are even less important on a hot day than they are on a cool day. So I'll, I'll tell you a story from an extraordinary young scholar who came to work with me thinking about this question of temperature and uh, a little bit about how to um, connect her discoveries with the way we think about air pollution. And uh, what we looked at as one example of Clara's research was the decrease in the odds of having a, a pretty bad ozone day of more than 100 ppb ozone uh, 
starting in about the late 90s and following through to today, um, or five years ago now. Uh, and you see in this top panel, that's the odds on a, on a hot day uh, of violating having a, a bad air quality day. And so in 1996, about somewhere between 90% and 100% of the days that were hot, you had high ozone. And by 2017, it was about half the days. And on a cool day, it's, we went from about half the time in 1996, 60% of the time, to basically never. Uh, so extraordinary progress in air pollution, but certainly not good enough. Because as you've heard about uh, from both my colleagues thinking about climate, it's getting warmer. So the number of hot days has gone up, even if even as the odds of having a bad air quality day on a hot day are going down. And the, by far the most important reason for this is that trees have become the dominant source of organic chemicals in cities. Uh, this is an example thinking about the larger Los Angeles basin extending from the coast in Santa Monica all the way out to Riverside. Uh, and the green is the part that comes from forests and trees. You see uh, at a cool temperature, they're about a third or a quarter of the organic chemicals that are important to making ozone come from trees. And at a warm temperature, it's about half. And there are more chemicals overall. So I want to wrap up here with uh, thinking about an electrified future. So what's uh, the cleaning of the passenger car has primarily come about from the introduction of the catalytic converter. And the catalytic converter takes the unwanted byproducts of burning fuel and uh, converts them to more chemicals that are less harmful. Um, takes the, the hydrocarbons from unburnt fuel, makes CO2 out of them, the nitrogen oxides and makes uh, nitrogen out of them, the, the key constituent in the air we breathe. Uh, when we electrify cars, all that goes away. We won't need catalytic converters anymore. Uh, and all kinds of other sources of chemicals to our atmosphere will become important. Trees and other non-vehicle emissions are becoming the most important part of the story. And uh, importantly, the, the emissions from those things are most important when it's hot. Uh, and it'll be, and in, it'll be interesting and important for us to collectively think about how to balance the fact that trees make more air pollution and make us less healthy with all the other ways that trees make us more healthy. And it's not, it's not an easy story or an easy policy fix, but it's an incredibly important one. And it's incredibly important that trees uh, transpire. Basically, when they take CO2 out of the atmosphere, they release water to the atmosphere. So it's essentially, they're sweating and they make cities cooler. And that's an imp incredibly important aspect of the trees. And also, they're beautiful. And so we need to enjoy them. So thank you for your attention. And I look forward to discussing this in your questions. Thank you very much, Ron. We have a few questions for you. The first question I will start with is, in the absence of anthropogenic emissions or human-caused emissions, how important are biogenic VOCs in the formation of pollutants, as these are seemingly natural and harmless sources? So, if you imagine uh, before the industrial age, uh, what sources of pollution there were, uh, trees were a key aspect of pollution. Uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains are so named because the haze associated with the forests and those mountains gave a blue tinge to the view. That's one natural example. Uh, and there were also, there were fires, both natural and human fires before industrialization. And so the, that kind of burning also contributed to pollution uh, pre uh, the combust internal combustion engine. Wonderful, thank you. 
So the next question comes from the chat from Nita Thakur. What are the typical tree emissions that cause pollution? So the, the typical tree emissions are a set of chemicals that are called terpenes. Uh, the one you probably know the best is limonene. That's the nice lemon smell in all kinds of household products. That's a common emission from trees. It has uh, compounds of the same chemical formula with different names that don't smell quite as nice. But it, it is the collection of smells that you would have if you walk through a wet forest. Uh, the, a forest after the rain always smells good. And that's those are all terpenes of various kinds. Wonderful, thank you. We have a second question from the chat from Matt Burroughs. Are there some trees that are more climate friendly than others? That's a really hard question. I think I, I am sure that the answer to that is yes, um, but I also wish I could tell you which ones and I, and I can't do that. Um, and there are trees, er, it ter turns out that a lot of what we know about how forests and trees work is uh, basic research done in the middle of pristine forests, far from cities. And uh, there's a growing body of scientists who were thinking about er er the urban biosphere and trees. And uh, they've pointed out that trees in cities grow about four times faster than their counterparts in a standard forest, that they, um, they, they die more frequently um, so that one of them wrote a paper that was sort of uh, live something like live fast and die more often. It had a, it was better than that, but um, there is that idea. Trees in cities don't, don't aren't stressed for water. They, when they don't find water, when they're not watered themselves, they find broken pipes. So they have tremendous access to water and nutrients. Um, so they um, they behave differently than their counterparts and we, we don't understand urban trees well enough. Wonderful, yeah. And so we have a third question from our chat or from our audience from Warren Gish. Any idea what fraction of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide come from passenger vehicles? John or Bill jump in if you remember the number better than I do. Uh, I think it's about um, a quarter, give or take. Okay, and perhaps what are our, what is the next sector that is problematic behind vehicles? Uh, I, I, the most important sectors are vehicles, electricity generation, uh, and then um, various kinds of uh, high energy manufacturing. Steel would be the important example. Okay, and I'd like to ask a question about Beacon. So what does your monitoring of the Bay Area with your Beacon network reveal about changes in air quality and pollutants compared to the results from LA? So our, our work in the Bay Area is focused first and foremost on greenhouse gas changes. And we've uh, measured that greenhouse gas emissions have been reduced by about 2% a year steadily for the last five years. That's almost certainly because the Bay Area is a, a, a higher electric vehicle consumer than almost anywhere else on the planet uh, per capita. So um, that's a really wonderful story in a way that we can be leading the world. On the air pollution side, uh, we're seeing the Bay Area is already a relatively clean from an air pollution point of view with important pockets of difference. Uh, and uh, we're starting to understand that, but can't say much more than that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ron. Overall, all of these presentations have been fascinating in regard to climate and air pollution. So with the time we have left, we will invite all of our speakers back for some follow-up questions. Okay. The first is for John. 
Do paleo climate data reveal a time in the past that is similar to what you project for future changes in Atlantic circulation? Oh, um, the 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 best analog for thermal headline shutdown is a time period called the Younger Dryas, which occurred about twelve thousand years ago, and uh, this happened during a time when the Earth was coming out of an ice age. Uh, so, uh, in coming out of the ice age, the ice cap, uh, the ice sheets melted. Uh, some of them, the, the the melt were pulled in lakes, and unfortunately, so at at some point, these lakes water got dumped into the North Atlantic. So when that happens, uh, you stabilize the North Atlantic thermal halide circulation and it stops. So that is probably the best analogy that we have uh, for thermal halide shutdown. But uh, it's not a good analogy in the sense that this actually happened during the cool climate, not in the warmer climate. Um, so yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so one thing we do know is that these uh, abrupt shifts in thermal headlight circulation generally occurred in cold climates are not warm. Uh, so perhaps that's an argument against having something, uh, this so abrupt circulation trend happen in today's warm climates. Uh, but again, we're not entirely certain. Wonderful, thank you. Now I will pose a question to all of our speakers. This is a question from our audience, Cheryl Clark. To what extent does restricting gas appliances mitigate climate change? And I'll start with Ron. Hi. So there are, there are two important gases that are contributing to greenhouse warming. Uh, CO2 is far and away the most important and uh, methane is uh, secondary. Uh, methane is very attractive because people think we can remove methane from the economic system more quickly uh, and buy a little time for the much more difficult removing all of the CO2 from the economic system. So in, in the part of the ecosystem that contributes, uh, uses methane uh, in our cooking and in gas stoves, uh, completely electrifying your house, um, ga gas stoves, gas water heaters, gas heat, uh, to the extent that we could do that on a large scale, it would make a, a difference. But uh, overall, it's much more important to focus on CO2. All right. Well, well, maybe one thing I could just interject. This is, Ron, much more your area of expertise than, than mine, but uh, getting rid of your gas stove and changing it to electric induction, for example, also has great benefits for your indoor air quality, right? So that's not on the global CO2 emissions end, but yeah. That, that is correct. Okay, thank you very much. I'll pose a general question to all panelists and maybe start with John. This is from Kathleen J. Does the North American monsoon produce our winter atmospheric rivers in California? Oh, um, this actually is a good question for Bill, because Bill actually works on the North American monsoon. But uh, in, in short, uh, there are different phenomena. Uh, the North American monsoon is a summertime phenomenon, uh, whereas our uh, atmospheric rivers are wintertime phenomenon. Uh, so where we are in California, we get our rains primarily in wintertime, uh, in part through atmospheric rivers, and in part through uh, uh, so like wintertime storms. Uh, in the summertime, uh, we in California do not get rainfall. Uh, the North American monsoon uh, actually affects rainfall over the Southwest. Uh, we're thinking about uh, New Mexico, Arizona. Uh, Bill, do you want to add to that? Nope, I, I mean, exactly right. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe the only thing I would add is that, yeah, the, the winter atmospheric rivers are kind of from these undulations in the jet stream. And during the winter, the jet stream sort of moves toward lower latitudes over our region. But then during summer, that jet stream kind of retreats up toward the pole and then the monsoon is sort of the, the tropical air masses kind of pushing, pushing up northward during our summertime. So just a little bit more insight into what John meant by those being two different phenomena, winter versus summer. 
Yeah, I just, so. just, just as a general comment, um, so like the, the physics of rainfall is particularly complicated. And, you know, so each season has its own type of rainfall. Uh, so trying to project what's going to happen in the future uh, is, is, is a pretty tough enterprise, as, as what you saw with what Bill talked about. And me as well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. And our last question um, regarding monsoons, I'll hand it back to Bill for this one. This is from David Gee, our audience member. Is it helpful to break up monsoon vortices to decrease intensity in future monsoons? And can it be done? I think, I think unfortunately, that's that's talking about some sort of geoengineering. And there has been for, for many decades people trying to think about, well, how might we prevent hurricanes, right? Could we coat the ocean in a you know a thin environmentally friendly oil? Could we put in some sort of, um, you know, could we shoot lasers into the center of hurricanes to kind of disrupt their thermal circulation? Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, what I would venture to say are outlandish ideas that, you know, people are nevertheless thinking about. Um, engineering these very, very large circulation patterns in the atmosphere is just almost impossible. So I, I think there's no way for us to, to um, do some sort of engineering to kind of prevent vortices from coalescing together or break them up in some way. The, the best we can do is kind of predict them and maybe harden our societal infrastructure, uh, give warnings to people so they can get out of the way and then prepare. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. I'm going to invite Dean Kahn to, to join us. I'd also like to thank all of our speakers for your enlightening presentations. Thank you. And to close, I'm going to hand it back over to Dean Kahn. Thanks, uh, Sonny. Thanks, Sonny. And uh, thanks uh, to you and to John and Bill and Ron for um, fascinating and compelling presentations. Of course, uh, climate change is a major topic of research on the Berkeley campus. Uh, you've been exposed to a small sampling of it here today. Um, and um, I hope that gives you some idea of, of how important our work at Berkeley is um, uh, on this pressing issue for, for all humans of the planet. Uh, I hope you'll join us on November 6th for our next installment of Basic Science Lights the Way. Uh, and that uh, meeting, we will discuss biological frontiers of physics. You'll learn about how the fields of physics and biology intersect and collaborate uh, and uh, help us decipher natural phenomena relevant to both fields. So we hope to see you there. Please reach out if you'd like to learn more about anything we covered. We'll be sharing additional resources with you by email about today's topic and speakers. And a video of today's session will be available at our Basic Science Lights the Way website uh, roughly one week from now. You can always return to Basic Science Lights the Way website to watch episodes you may have missed. Uh, thanks for attending and showing such interest uh, in our program. Uh, we couldn't do our work without your attention and support. So until November 6th, um, stay curious, fiat lux, and go bears. Thanks very much. Bye.